Welcome to Canberra on a reasonably warm and sunny Canberra morning. Um, and thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Cedar, for inviting me to, to speak today. I'm a very big fan of, of Cedar uh, and the important work that it does and the contribution that Cedar makes to the big debates in Australia and what should be the big debates in Australia. I've been to a lot of Cedar events in my time as well. Uh, first, when I was in the private sector and more recently as a politician, Stephen, in fact, um, I was in Townsville last week for the Cedar State of the State address given there by the Queensland Premier. Uh, but this is the first time that I've spoken at a Cedar event and I consider it a privilege. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you today. It's Monday morning and everyone's had coffee, I think, so brains are sharp and ready to fire. So I thought I might start off with what is a reasonably hard question, and this requires audience participation. Who do you think is the most important person that's ever lived? Well, that's caused a few heads to rise. <laughs> it's not Malcolm Turnbull, by the way. Well, here's my theory. My, my, it's a rather bold, out there theory. I think potentially one of the most important, at least one of the most important people to ever live uh, is a musical instrument counterfeiter from Glasgow who lived about 200 years ago. At the same time that Captain Cook landed at Botany Bay uh, and Thomas Jefferson was drafting the Declaration of Independence, this musical instrument counterfeiter was tinkering with steam engines. He didn't invent the steam engine, but he did improve it. He changed what was really a, a rudimentary device for pumping water into something that led to the creation of factories, mass production, railways, mass transportation, and the emergence of the modern city. His name was James Watt. I don't know whether he was a, a predecessor of yours, Ian, but supposedly, there you go. You've got good DNA. We recruit well in the Australian Public Service. <laughs> What James Watt did between 1765 and 1776 transformed the world. Now, hopefully we've got a slide here that'll tell the story for us. Okay, great. This is a slide, uh, this is a graph that comes out of a terrific book called The Second Machine Age. And what it shows is the growth in the world's population and human development over the last 8,000 years or so. And those little bumps that you can see if you can, I'm, I'm sure up, up there sitting up higher than I am, you can see it. The little bumps that track along there are the rise of ancient Greece, uh, the Roman Empire and the Renaissance, and then that sharp cliff face that you can see on the right, that's the Industrial Revolution. And James Watt lit the fuse for all of that. And that, I think, gives him a pretty decent claim to being at least one of the most significant people to have ever lived. There's also a pretty good argument that something like this is happening again right now. But this time it's not steam engines that are doing the heavy lifting. It's the internet, it's computer power, and it's digital technology. This week, the Singapore Prime Minister is in town. And thinking about his visit, it reminded me of those famous words of his father almost 40 years ago that stung this country into action. Remember back in 1980, Lee Kuan Yew said we'd become the poor white trash of Asia if we didn't reform, if we didn't transform our economy, open it up. We still remember those words today. And they certainly stuck in the mind of Bob Hawke and drove a lot of the decisions he, make, he made. When Lee Kuan Yew died last year, Hawke said, I thought he was right. And his harsh but fair comment helped galvanise my determination to undertake the reforms that would save us from that fate and set us on a better path. 30 years ago this year, Paul Keating gave us an equally brutal assessment of our economic prospects. He was in Kyneton in country Victoria, talking on the phone to John Laws on 2GB then, when he said if we didn't reform, we'd end up a banana republic. And that caused a bit of a stir at the time. If my memory serves me rightly, the stock market didn't like it. Bob Hawke didn't like it either. He was in, he was in China at the time uh, and was less than impressed. 
But looking back now, those words seem like a turning point. They shook us out of the economic stupor we were in. We finally got it. We had to wrench ourselves out of this bog of complacency. We had to strip away all the things that we were hiding behind, all the things we were used to. We had to change the way we did things. We had to become globally competitive, and we did. The result was an economic transformation, an economy that's now three times the size it was in the 1980s, Real wages rose, living standards improved, unemployment's almost half what it was then, inflation's been squashed. And we've continued to grow. We've continued to grow at a time where other countries haven't. Now, for 25 years, it's a world record. It's an extraordinary achievement when you think about it. So what's the equivalent challenge today? Well, we tend to spend a lot of time and a lot of column inches focusing on things like tax, fiscal policy and industrial relations. And they are all very, very important debates, debates we need to have. But I don't think we spend nearly enough time and energy on the things that we're talking about here this morning, innovation, and particularly the digital transformation of our economy. It's not a boutique debate. I think that it's just as important to making Australia globally competitive in the 21st century as Hawke and Keating's reforms were in the late 20th century. Now, smart companies get this. Smart businesses, smart boards understand that you have to keep up and adapt or you die. You disappear. When most of us were kids, you didn't take photographs on a phone. You took it on a camera and you got the Kodak film and you took it down to the chemist to get the film reproduced and printed. Usually it took a day. If you spent a little bit more money, then you could probably get the photos back in an hour or so. In its heyday, Kodak used to employ 145,000 people. Now it doesn't even exist. Instagram does, though. In 2012, when it was bought by Facebook, it had 13 employees and 30 million users. And Facebook paid about a billion dollars for it. It's a similar story at Blockbuster. Once upon a time, they had 4,800 stores in the US alone. They employed 60,000 people. Now all the company-owned stores have gone. And there's just a few franchisees. There are no Netflix stores, but they do have about 83 million customers already in more than 190 countries, and they employ only 3,500 people. Half the companies on the US Fortune 500 list have disappeared in the last 15 years, most because of this, a sort of digital Darwinism. And the same sort of threat that faces companies also faces countries, but just on a bigger scale. Digital Darwinism, you know what I mean. In the decades ahead, it'll be the countries that transform their economies to meet this challenge the quickest and the best and the most fundamentally that'll be the most successful. And the ones that don't, or the ones that take too long to adjust, they'll be the ones standing at the dock waving goodbye as jobs and businesses go overseas watching as unemployment goes up, as GDP goes down, and as disadvantage becomes more pronounced, and the division between rich and poor grows wider. It's a 21st century version of Keating's potassium prophecy, if you like, a digital banana republic. Now, it's not easy to predict what's going to happen in the future, but it's not hard to see trends, the sort of mega trends that I see in your agenda you were talking about this morning. When I finished high school, a bit over 25 years ago, the job market looked a lot different to what it looks like today. There are now half a million fewer secretarial jobs than there were then. The number of labourer jobs over the course of the last 25 years has dropped by about 400,000. The number of technicians and tradies has also dropped by 250,000. And the number of machinery operators has dropped by 100,000. In contrast to that, there are now 700,000 more or 54% more professionals than there were 25 years ago. And there are 400,000 or 87% more community and personal service workers. This is automation at work. It's not new. It's been happening at least since James Watt and the Industrial Revolution. Technology destroying old jobs and creating new ones. But it is true to say the pace is quickening. 
the pace is quickening. And I have to pay tribute here to CEDA and the work that CEDA has done on this front. Uh, the report that you produced last year on this I think was very important. It predicted that five million jobs that are currently being done in Australia are highly likely to be done by computers in the next decade or two. That's 40% of the current Australian workforce. Another two million jobs, according to the report, have a medium chance of being automated. That's shocking, right? But it shouldn't be. I think it's I think a lot of credit needs to be given to this report, the attention that it got and the data provided in it, whether, whether the, the actual numbers are right or not, the trend that it identified. A lot of credit needs to be paid to that report for finally shining a light on this in the Australian public debate. I think uh, it's arguable uh, that it's forced this issue now onto the agenda in the same way that Lee Kuan Yew and Paul Keating's comments did all those years ago. So what do we do about it? The challenge here, I think, is the same as the one that Hawke and Keating faced. Being globally competitive. Remember what I said about digital Darwinism. The countries that are the, the fastest and that adapt the best, they're the ones that will be the most successful. Now, at the moment, Australia is not one of those countries. We're not as competitive on this front as we need to be. Harvard Business Review had a look at this last year and they ranked the digital capacity of different countries. They put countries of the world into four different categories. Stand out, watch out, break out and stall out. And guess which one Australia ended up in? The last one, the bad one, stall out. There's a lot of reasons for this but there's a few I want to point to. When you look at countries that were the most successful 200 years ago, when the Industrial Revolution was sparked, one thing stands out. They were the ones that built the best and the biggest railway networks, the tracks that James Watt's steam engines ran on. Now, what's the equivalent of that today? Well, arguably, it's broadband networks. Three years ago, we were ranked 30th in the world for internet speed. Now we're ranked about 60th. Singapore's first, Hong Kong's second, South Korea's third, Japan's fourth. The US, Canada, most of Asia, most of Europe are all ahead of us. Even Romania, Russia, Slovakia and Poland are in front of us. Even New Zealand's in front of us as well. We're also behind when it comes to access to capital for startups. Our venture capital industry is small by world standards. We're off the pace when it comes to R&D. And compared to other countries, we're terrible at commercialising our good ideas, getting our universities and industry to work together. The area that worries me more than any of these, though, is in skills or our lack of them. This is where I think the real fight has to be had and it's where we're massively off the pace. In 2003, we produced about 9,000 IT graduates. Last year, that number was about 5,000. It's dropped by almost half. Over the same period, the number of people who've graduated in China with a STEM degree has jumped from 500,000 to 3.5 million. However you measure STEM and STEM qualifications, one thing is certain, and that is that we are producing a smaller proportion of graduates with STEM qualifications out of our universities than our major competitors in Asia are. And the result of that you see in your own businesses and in other businesses across Australia. Now, let me just give you one example, and that's Google, based around the country, but largely in Sydney. Google employ 1,000 people in Australia. About half of them do jobs that require STEM skills, and about half of those are recruited from overseas. Now, Google isn't Robinson Crusoe. They're not the only ones with this recruitment problem. A few weeks after that CEDA report came out last year, another important report was released. Now, this one was from Deloitte, and it revealed that last financial year, we imported about 21,000 IT workers. According to this Deloitte report, we'll need another 100,000 IT workers in the next six years. Now, here's the interesting thing, 100,000 more IT workers in the next six years. About a third of them will be Australian-made, will be graduates out of our universities. The rest of them, 
about 70,000 jobs will be done by people that we bring in from around the world. You can, I hope you can start to see the problem now. Over the next few decades, millions of jobs will potentially disappear. Millions more will potentially be created, but they won't necessarily be done by Australians. They won't even necessarily be done here in Australia. Now, credit where credit's due. Uh, you'll hear from Greg Hunt, the new industry minister, uh, after me in about 20 minutes' time or so. The government is now trying to tackle some of these problems. And a lot of what they're doing, a lot of what was uh, crystallised in that industry statement the government released last year uh, comes out of the policies that were developed by Labor, uh, by Bill Shorten, by Chris Bowen, myself, Ed Husick and others who come up with uh, similar ideas. They're all good. They need to be implemented. It's an area where we do see more bipartisanship than in other areas of, of public policy. But there's still more that we need to do. From the bottom up, from local government, state government, at a federal government level as well, we've got to look at everything we do and all the laws that we administer and make sure that they're fit for a digital age and are better than what our competitors are doing in other parts of the world. Now, I presume this is what every board worth its salt is doing with its business, making sure that its business is fit for a digital age, that what it is doing is more than competitive with the people that it seeks to beat in the marketplace. And that's what we've got to do as a government, as a country as well. I also want to make this point, and that is that this is not just an economic challenge. There are also real social consequences at play here as well. Last year, CEDA produced another important report, and this one focused on entrenched disadvantage. Now, I represent Paul Keating's old seat of Blacksland in the southwest of Sydney. It's not a rich area. Uh, it's a place with a lot of disadvantage. The unemployment rate is almost twice what it, the national average is. And here's the interesting thing. Um, research shows that if English is your first language and you speak it well, then your, your risk of being unemployed is about 5%. Um, but if English is a second language, if you can't speak English or you speak it poorly, then the risk of being unemployed in my electorate is 25%. It's a massive difference. English has a very big and important impact on your career prospects and your employment prospects. Now, think about the world that our kids are going to grow up in. I'm about to become a dad myself in about three weeks' time, I think. So that's why I've got the phone here, just in case. <laughs> um, in the world that that little boy or that little girl grows up in, it won't just be English that determines their employability. Um, it'll be their digital skills. The US economist Tyler Cohen talks about a future where there are two types of people. Those who are good at working with intelligent machines and those who are replaced by them. Now this doesn't mean that we're all going to end up being computer programmers or software engineers, of course not. But it does mean that we all need to be increasingly computer literate. If you're not, you're going to struggle. Life will be a lot harder. And my big worry is that we're going to see this, see life get harder, uh, in places like the electorate that I represent, where there is already significant disadvantage, seeing that become more entrenched by these big trends. It's why we, it's why the Labor Party puts so much store in education. I'm the first person in my family to finish high school. Now, nowadays, if you don't finish high school, it's almost impossible to get a job. In the future, it's going to be even harder. It's why we focus so much on Gonski. It's why boosting teacher quality and teacher skills are so important. It's why we keep making the case for incorporating coding and computational thinking uh, into the school curriculum from kindy up. Not a revolutionary idea, it's done in England, Vietnam, many other countries around the world. And it's why we need to make sure that not only do we meet that, na that national target of 90% of students finishing high school across the board, but that in particular we meet that target in areas like the one that I represent. Um, now Stephen said I've now got a new portfolio. I'm now in the, in the trade portfolio and I want to talk just briefly about one other mega trend. You see this 
You see this trend in the rise of Donald Trump, however much longer that lasts. Um, you see it in Brexit, and you even see it in our recent election and the return or the re-emergence of One Nation. The Prime Minister has been talking a lot recently about creeping protectionism here and around the world, and he's right to be concerned. The point I, I want to make today is that this is just a symptom of something deeper and more concerning that's going on here. In the decade before the global financial crisis, the living standards of many people in developed economies around the world went up. But since the GFC, they've been flatlining or falling. And I think this explains a lot of what's going on here, a lot of the reason for the reception that people like Trump and One Nation have received. There are a lot of people that are hurting, a lot of people feeling like they're going backwards rather than forwards. And it's not just a feeling, it's a fact. In the UK, the median income for people aged 31 to 59 is now less than it was a decade ago. In the US, the typical American family is worse off than they were a quarter of a century ago. A lot of Americans are still earning less now than they were before Lehman Brothers collapsed. And here in Australia, in the last two years, national income per person has also gone backwards. Now, some of this is a hangover from the GFC, but it is also part of a bigger trend, a bigger trend of increasing inequality. I think you've been talking a bit about this this morning. You can see more of it uh, on the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald. Here in Australia, the gap between rich and poor is the biggest that it's been in 75 years. And when you add to this, the big jumps we've seen in unemployment in WA and Queensland recently as the mining boom tails off, and then you add in the increasing cost of housing in places like where I live in Sydney, and then you throw in what we're talking about today, automation, the threat of a robot taking your job or your kid's job, and you can see that what you've got here is a very toxic mix. That's why you don't hear the Prime Minister talk so much anymore about what an exciting time it is to be alive. And the simple reason is because it doesn't resonate. It's not what people are thinking. It's not what people believe. And there's a real risk that with automation, with the digital transformation of our economy, that this gap will continue to widen and will continue to grow. We'll continue to see the hollowing out of our middle class. And if that happens, we'll see lower growth and we'll see more Trumps and more Brexits and more Hansons. All of the evidence from CETA to the World Bank to the IMF indicates that greater inequality means lower growth. But if we can transform our economy to meet the sort of challenges that I'm talking about today, and if we can reduce this gap, then our economy will be bigger and the Australia of tomorrow will be an even better place to live. This is where the debate in Australia, I think, needs to be. It's where I'm focused. It's where Labor's focused. We have got to get this right. Because if we don't, then the words of those economic giants from 30 odd years ago, they'll come back to haunt us. Thanks very much.